everybody. How you doing today? Oh my goodness. I'm so thankful to be here. Thank you, Pastor Jason and Veronica, for letting me speak. Love you guys. What you don't know is they're more than just my pastor. They're my mentors. My wife and I have been able to walk with them for so long, and they, they let me come up here and preach every once in a while. That's dangerous for you guys, but would you shout out our pastors? We love them so much. I love you guys. You've blessed my family so much. It's an honor to be here. And you know what? I just want to look around the room. How are you guys doing? You're looking good today. You're looking great. After Thanksgiving, it's easier to hide those extra pounds when it's cold outside. When, when I lived in Orange County, you know, everyone would go, why are you wearing a sweatshirt? And I'm like, I'm fat, you know? It's like, that's what you do. And then literally, this is everybody's Thanksgiving. You eat dinner, and I'm at, like, my wife's grandparents' house. And if you know anything about a grandparent, you eat. Like, if you don't eat, that's a sin. And so I'm sitting there, and here comes food. I'm like, I don't want to eat anything else. And my wife just looks at me. It's that look every husband knows. You're going to eat today. It's th You're thankful to eat today. And so I start eating, and I swear I'm not going to have any pie. And then, you know, some time goes by, and it's like they're all homemade. Homemade lemon meringue pie, homemade Dutch chocolate pie, apple pie. And I'm like, all right, I'll take one of each. <laughs> this amazing thing happens after, like, everybody eats, though. Every wife gets up and starts cleaning. It's the craziest thing, and instantly every husband's like, I'm out, I'm out of there. I ain't cleaning anything up, you know? And you're like, it's more of a wobble, you know what I mean? But we made it to church today, and we're gonna continue on in our series, The Names of God, and this is what I believe today. I believe God wants to reveal something to you about his character that has the power to change your life. And here's the key. I could say a million things today, but the most important thing I could tell you is that God loves you and that he is for you and that he wants to speak to you today. Are you ready to receive? Come on, you're ready. And you're awake too. Amen. Well, I'm so glad we're, we're continuing on in the names of God and we're looking at the Jehovah names of God in the Old Testament. What's awesome about God is he introduced himself with his name, his Jehovah name. We understand God is the all-powerful God, and that's what Jehovah actually means. It's the Latinization of the word Yahweh, or Yahweh, as we know. Let's just say Yahweh, Yahweh, right? Yahweh, that's, that's God, and it means I am the beginning and the end, the one and only God, and when we see Jehovah, or Yahweh, in scripture, that's what he's saying. He's saying, I am. He's beyond comprehension. He's the Alpha in the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the God of the universe. But although he is those things, he also wants us to know that he's a personal God. And he reveals that in all the names, his character, how he, he wants to have relationship with you and I. So we look at the names we've already done. The Lord is my shepherd last week with Pastor Sean. Great job. The Lord is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He fights for us. And we've been looking at Isaiah 52, 6, and here's the truth today. God said, I will reveal my name to my people, and they will come to know its power. How many of you know there's power in the name of God? There's power in the names of God. And so today, I want to give you another name of God that has power. Do you need some power today? Come on. The name of God today is Jehovah Nisi, and it literally translates, the Lord is my banner. Okay, I get it. The other names make sense. And then we're like, the Lord's my banner? Really? When Pastor Jason said, you're preaching the Lord is my banner, I'm like, thanks a lot, Pastor. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. But I was like, banner? Like, couldn't it be something like, like better than that, like a banner? And I think we know banners, but, but what, the others make sense. But what's a Nisi? What's, what's a banner? And, and the truth is, he is our banner. Like, God is our banner. And, and it kind of makes sense, but it's kind of odd. Why would God take time? in one of these descriptive names to tell us that he's our banner, that, that he's our banner. Another way of looking at this Nisi, this banner or flag, is it's the item we wave and hold to let everybody else know what we prioritize, what we belong to, who we fight for. Think about the Olympics. They finish, they win, they grab their flag, they go, this is what I've been fighting for. This is who I've been fighting through. The flag says, this is where I'm from. This is who I am. This is what I fight for, what I compete for. This is the place I compete for and from. But flags and banners, they go far beyond just nations. 
It's human nature. All throughout human history, people have been fashioning flags and banners to symbolize what they stand for, to symbolize a cause or a group that they belong to that they're passionate about. Any cause, start thinking about it, with marches in the street and causes around the world, one of the first things people do is they say this, this is who we are, this is what we're passionate about, oh yeah, and and here's our flag, and they wave their flag around. Here's a banner because there's something in human nature that knows we need to fly something that says who we are. If you turn on the TV right now, you're probably going to see a Jewish flag and a lot of people who are really ticked off, but you'll also see a Palestinian flag and a lot of people who are really ticked off. We kind of lose that sense of, of pride because in America, things are changing. Times are shifting. You might see, you might have seen, and you might begin to see as we enter into political season, Trump flags. You might see Biden flags. You probably see gay pride flags. There are a lot of flags being flown around. And we're about to read about God revealing himself as our flag, as our banner. We have a God in the Old Testament who's saying, I'm the one you fight for, fight from. I'm the one you place your identity into. I am the, the, the one you're anchored to, I'm the one that gives you purpose. I'm the cause above all causes. I am Jehovah Nisi. And there's power in that name. And so what flag are you flying today? What, what flag is over you today? Because I want to show you and I want to reveal to you how God revealed himself as this name in scripture. There's something for us today, amen? But in order for us to understand that, we need to go back into Exodus. In chapter Exodus 16, the, the Lord has just led the Israelites out of slavery. They were oppressed. They were in the wilderness. And they got upset. They were frustrated. They got hungry. And they're like my kids, you know, you feed them something and they're not happy. They don't want any of it. And so they're literally in the wilderness and they're like, Lord, give us some manna to eat. Give us something to eat because we're hungry. And the Bible says that they were so mad at Moses that they were thinking about killing him. And so God goes, all right, I'm going to give them what they want. And manna literally falls from the sky. And they're like walking through fields of manna. Have you ever been so desperate for a miracle that you're, God, if you just do this one thing, I'll never ask for anything again. Well, pretty soon, like a week later, they were like, God, we're sick and tired of this manna. You better give us some meat. We're, we're tired of the bread. Uh, side note, if he would have given them salsa with that, I think they'd have been fine. Chips and salsa is all you need. But, but he didn't, so maybe, like, that's what I would have done. But instead, he gave them quail. So the, here they are. They have quail. And then they, they, again, they're in Rephidim, and they have no water. It's a very arid place. It's, it's like a desert with rocks and and cliffs, and small mountains, and they begin to complain because they had no water. And Moses strikes the rock. He provides water for them. But this is what I want you to see. In Exodus 17, 7, Moses called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? The same people who had seen God perform miracles Miracle after miracle, the same people who literally were eating every day their daily bread provided by God, they questioned if God was really among them or not. Here they're, they're witnessing all these things, but they're, they're questioning. And we can judge the Israelites, but we've all wondered at some point in our lives, where's God in this? Where, where's God when I need him the most? Maybe you've had your back up against the wall and you're like, Lord, I don't see you in this. God, I've been fighting this fight for a long time, and I'm not seeing you come through. Where are you? It's easy to judge them. We've all experienced trials so difficult, so painful, that begin to wonder, God, are you even with me? Those moments that that test your faith, your endurance, your hope. But God is so good, he, he meets their needs and literally, you know, provides them with water out of a rock. But then one verse later, I love how God does this. 
they moved from one crisis to another. Exodus 17, 8. It says, while the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. So they went from having no water, just getting water, and then God's like, watch this. They're going to come attack you. You know, it's like, you can't make this up. And that's like life. You know, we're just moving from one trial to the next. And it's like, the moment you get your hand on it and you get a grip on what you're going through, it seems like something else pops up. Something that wants to test you. Something that wants to try you. Try your faith try your perseverance and that's what happened to him has that ever happened to you you just can't catch a break exodus 17 9 it continues moses said to joshua this is what we're going to do choose some men go out and fight the army of amalek for us tomorrow though I'm going to go stand at the top of the hill holding the staff of god in my hand you gotta imagine joshua being like oh I'm going to fight and you're going to chill on the mountain like, that sounds like a sweet gig. That would be me. All right, here's what we're going to do. You're going to go fight them out there? I'm, I'm chilling, but you go fight. I'm going to go up there and, and pray, right? You're like, I'm going to pray, and you go fight. And he's like, okay, but I'm just being a little dramatic here. But it goes on. It says, so Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of a nearby hill. And as long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. Whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses was literally fighting with supernatural strength and power of God, which is crazy. The Bible says as he lifted his hands, everyone on the battlefield was winning. As he lowered them, he was losing. Even though God was doing a miracle through him, he still needed people next to him to help him. God might be doing a miracle through you, but you cannot do it alone. I don't know why you think you can fight alone. We just, we have problems. We don't want to be around people. We don't want to let people into our challenge. We want to walk it out alone. But God is saying, no, 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 no. We all get tired and weary. And we see it here in Exodus 12, um, verse 12 and 13. Moses' hands, they grew tired. And so, you know, they, they took a stone and they put it under him and they sat on it. And, and Aaron and her held his hands up, literally, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. This is my first point for you today. The battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. Joshua did not win the battle. Joshua was fighting on the battlefield, but he did not win. Are you seeing this? You got to fight on the battlefield, but there's something happening on the mountain that determines victory. So he's literally in the battle. He's doing the work. He's for sure working. He's literally fighting. He's watching people die around him. The Bible says that at some point, Moses' hands went down and they started losing, a.k.a. people died. But also, he was killing people. Holler at your boy, right? It's a little gangster. But make no mistake, God was the one doing the heavy lifting. God was the one doing the miracle. We don't have enough strength to win the battle. He won because Moses was on the mountain holding up the banner. But we have a God who fights our battles. Psalm 60 verse 4 says, but you have raised a banner for those who fear you, a rallying point in the face of attack. What's your banner? What do you turn to when you're struggling? What do you turn to when you're in the midst of a battle? You turning to the banner, Jehovah Nisi, or you turning to yourself because the Lord is your victory. The battle belongs to the Lord. The reality is that battles will find us. That's for sure. You can't avoid the battles. But when they do find you, you can rest assured that the battle belongs to the Lord. So Joshua overcomes the Amalekites, and this is the moment God reveals himself as our banner. I love this. Exodus 17, um, verse 14 and 16. Then we're going to get into what the Lord is saying to us today. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it. Don't you love that? I think I'd be like Joshua. God's like, I'm going to write this down, but you're going to have to tell him, okay? He don't read well. No, I'm kidding. You got to tell him, all right? This is important. I need to make sure he hears this because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. I'm going to destroy him. I'm going to wipe him out. You don't have to worry about them. I'm going to destroy them. You write it down and tell Joshua. I know he killed a lot of them and some of them got away. I'm going to get him. I'm coming for him. God is saying, today you defeated Amalek and I want you to know that I am your banner. 
I'm what you fight for and fight from. As you go into battle, there will be a banner over you. We don't fight for a man, for a cause. We fight from a place of victory in Christ. It goes on to say, Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. And he said this. You need to catch this. Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord. This wasn't a physical fight. This was a spiritual attack against God's people. Moses said, listen, God's our banner. This wasn't a physical fight. This was a spiritual fight. They came against the people of God and the throne of God and the things of God. But because they did that, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation forever against them. Did you catch that? God said, write this down. That means shut up and pay attention. I'm writing this down. Did you know that's the first time in the Bible that God said, write it down? That God told him, write that, Moses. You, oh, write it. I'm serious. That was like grandma walking in with the spoon. You just knew. Boy, she didn't say anything. She came at you with that spoon. It's like, you run it out the door. The last one out the door is getting spanked by grandma. Write this down. But this is what's crazy to me. The God of grace, truth, peace, love, mercy, wants to utterly destroy a people group. But it's because it wasn't physical. It was spiritual. You need to understand Jehovah Nisi. But in order to understand what it means for us, we need to answer the question, who is Amalek? Who is this people group that God said and swore to utterly destroy? Because the God I know is the God of love. And he is a God of love, but he's trying to teach us something. Are you ready? Come on, let's learn together. So who is Amalek? They're a group of people who belong to and follow their leader, Amalek, who is a descendant of Esau. Esau is a branch of Abraham and Isaac's ancestral tree. If we're honest, so pretty much the Israelites were fighting their second cousins. If we're honest, we'd admit some of our biggest problems come from people in our own family, right? It's like, that's just a fact of life, and that's what was happening here. This is the Esau who sold his birthright and wanted to kill Jacob. You need to understand, a birthright was, was a spiritual right. But Esau despised the things of God. He didn't count them as holy. Esau was against the things of the Lord. And we see in Malachi 1.3, so you can get a sense of how God felt about Esau, God said this, but Esau I have hated, and I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. The Amalekites, descendants of Esau, have completely turned their backs on God. They've been worshiping false gods and giving themselves over to evil for generations. So God in this story uses the Amalek and the Amalekites as a picture of evil. A picture of evil. So when we're looking at this story and we're talking about Amalek, it's representing evil moving against the people of God. Evil moving against the plans of God. Just like evil was marching against the people of God in Rephidim, evil also marches against you personally. There's always an Amalek. Anytime God is moving and acting in your life, you can bet everything that Satan is also moving to counteract what God wants to do in your life. But here's the hope. If there's a personal attack, then there's a personal Jehovah Nisi plan in your life. John 10.10 says this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. It's fun to say that God has a plan for your life. I wish that was the message I could preach today. God's got a plan, rah, rah, hoorah. But the truth is, God does have a plan for your life, but so does Satan. He does. It's not fun, but it's real. And and I'm not trying to tell ghost stories to you right now. Halloween has passed, okay, amen? But if we are not aware of the plan and purpose of the enemy, then we will never achieve the plan and purpose of God in our lives. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12 tells us this. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. There is always going to be an Amalek in your life. There's always going to be a battle. 
Some of you are in a battle right now. Some of you had Thanksgiving with family members, and you literally know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Amen. The key is not learning. I need you to hear this. The key is not learning how to avoid the battle. God is telling us that he is Jehovah Nisi. He is our banner. He goes over us, before us, and with us. Today we need to learn, though, how God wants us to fight if he is our banner. Because the enemy is real and he is fighting. Today I want to give you some practical tactics. I'm calling them keys to victory so that you can fight what the enemy is throwing at you. I love fighting. You know, I'm a fighter. I tell my wife, I'm like, listen, when we get into disagreements, I, I like to, I don't run, okay? I fight. Some of you, you like to fight. This is going to be good for you. We'll simmer you down after service and make sure you don't get any trouble, okay? But the first thing we need to do, if we're going to walk in victory, if we're going to declare Jehovah Nisi over our life, is we need to get in the fight. You need to get in the fight. Get in the fight. You're saying, Brennan, what do you mean? I'm literally being attacked. I'm in the fight. Some battles find us. That's true. And you don't have a choice but to fight. I think about people who are diagnosed with cancer. You don't get to choose. You fight. You fight. You go for it. You can't run from it. But some of us have learned to run and hide really well. You're really good at running from the battle and hiding. You think you're doing a good, you think you're doing a good thing. You're like, oh, no, 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 I'm not involved in that. No, you are involved in that. No, the enemy's actually using that against you. We know how to stay away from the fight, but the sad reality is that the battle is always right outside your door. You think you're winning because you're hiding, but you're losing because Satan is keeping you from victory. He's keeping you from the victory God's already declared over your life. But you're, you're, you're just, I'm not going to be around them. No, God wants to give you victory. You can be around them. A lot of us aren't even in the fight. We've lost our hope, our strength, that things could even get better. You, you, you say, well, things can't get better. Why would I fight? This just, you know, Br Brennan, you know, this is just the way it is. You might even say, well, it's not that bad. You start to live with it. You start to just accept this as a new reality. You start to believe it can't change. You say, this is how my family is. This is how my kids are. This is just how I feel. This is just what he does. We've given up. We've given up. Sometimes we don't want to fight because we're broken. We're hurt. So we run. We avoid. I have my own personal challenge with some family members. And over the years, it hasn't gotten better. And... I literally came to a moment where I wanted to give up and I wanted to stop fighting. And the Lord revealed to me, Brennan, you gave up a long time ago. You might not be sinning against them, but you've stopped fighting. And I even stopped praying about it. I had just given up. God, it's just the way it is. I'm just, I quit fighting. God convicted me. That'll happen when you start preparing to preach a message. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the Lord convicted me. But I lean on this, 2 Chronicles 15, 7. This is what God said to me. But as for you, be strong and do not give up. For your work will be rewarded. Some of you, you're working. You go, Brennan, I can't fight because that means I got to work. No, you will work. But you will be rewarded. Do not give up. God is your banner. Come on, we got to get in the fight. We need to get in the fight. It's easier to run than to fight. But in these times, we have to remember the Lord is our banner, our victory. We have to get in the fight. It's not fair to just pray about something you won't even fight for. Oh, God, fix this in my life, but you're not even fighting. The Lord's like, you want me to do the miracle, and you're sitting at home playing Xbox. Oh, my Lord Jesus, help us. God, you take it. You do the miracle. It's not worth my time, but you should still do it. Maybe instead of praying for someone or something to change, you should actually start praying for a heart change. God changed my heart because I quit a long time ago. God changed my heart so that you can renew the fight inside of me. God, remind me that you're my banner and I'm going to go to war and I'm going to believe that there's victory even in my family. Oh, now you think I'm crazy because I'm talking about victory in your family. Do you believe God could have victory in your family? I believe it. So we got to fight. We got to get back to the fight.
You were in it, but you were out. But we're going to get back in the fight. The second key to victory. Oh, this is so good. We need to fight on the mountain and in the valley. Some of you only know how to fight in the valley. You only know how to get physical and meet the fight head on. Like I said, you're a fighter like me. You're really good at fighting. You're like, man, get me in the fight because I can do that. I know how to work hard. I know how to persevere. I can fight. But all you know is the valley. All you know is how to do what you do. Maybe people call you hard-headed. Wives around the room or elbowing husbands. Amen. You're a challenger. You're not afraid of the fight. Some of you don't like confrontation. So you like to stay on the mountain and think about it and pray about it. What have you been doing over there? I've just been praying about it. And I'm not saying praying is bad. Fighting's not bad either. I'm just praying about it. Have you talked to him? No, I'm praying about it though. When are you going to talk to him? When the Lord releases me to do it. Okay. I release you right now. Poof. You know what I'm saying? Go and fight. Go and fight, right? That's point one. We often respond with one of these two extremes when we are faced with a battle or fight over something valuable. Think about this. Think about how you fight for your marriage, your family, your children, your finances, your health. In one extreme, some people fight from the mountain only. They say, I'm just going to trust God and talk to him, and he will fix everything. Other people go to the other extreme, the valley, trying to win the battle in the valley, forgetting all about the mountain. They look to their own resources, their own skills, their own abilities, willpower, determination to overcome what they are up against, all the while failing to look to God, forgetting that our strength and victory is in him, forgetting that he is our banner. This is what I want you to know today. Only when we bring the valley and the mountain together will we experience victory. You cannot fight from one place. You have to fight from both places. You cannot just fight on the mountaintop and say, God, I'm not doing anything practically. You've got to fight on the mountain and in the valley. To put it plainly, the valley is what I can do practically. And the mountain is what God can do spiritually. you got to fight on the, on the mountain and in the valley. There's some things that God wants to do spiritually through you, but there are also some things you need to do practically when you get in the fight. Some of us don't know how to fight on the mountain. I get that, but we need to learn how to pray. You need a prayer rhythm in your life. You need to go to the mountain every day. You need to go to the mountain and start naming some things. And saying, God, I'm fighting for this again. And he's going to go, okay, I've been fighting, but I'm glad you're fighting now. You need to realize there is more power on the mountain than in the valley. But God wants you to go into the valley and fight. Some of you, you know how to pray, but you forgot that God wants to do the miracle through you in the valley. I love David. You know, when David slayed Goliath, there was no miracle, you know, that happened when he put the armor on or when he grabbed his sling. The miracle happened when David had enough faith to walk into the valley, swing that little sling, and the miracle, this is exactly when the miracle happened. Are you ready for it? He had to go into the valley and work. The moment that rock, that little stone, left his sling, that's when God was like, okay, I'll do a miracle. And he took that little stone and went, like the matrix, and it came at Goliath and it just, it killed him. God wants to do the miracle through you, but you're going to have to get into the valley if you want to experience the miracle. You need to be on the mountain, but you need to be in the valley. Amen? Deuteronomy 20, verse 4, says this. says, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. If you're fighting from one extreme, you'll never experience the victories God has for you. So we're going to get in the fight. We're going to fight from the mountain. We're going to fight from the valley. We're going to fight spiritually. We're going to fight practically. And we see this play out a lot. I see this play out with kids. Kids are awesome. They're also not so awesome sometimes. Amen? Okay, anyone who didn't say anything, they don't have kids yet. They're like, oh, kids will be great. Yep, okay, cool. Um, (laughs) Did you know there's a battle for your children happening right now? There is a battle for your children. If you don't believe me, watch any show nowadays. They're trying to win your kids and teach them something. They're trying to confuse their identity. But you need to remember this isn't a physical battle. This is Amalek. This is evil marching against the people and things of God. 
We have to fight for our kids. We have to fight practically and spiritually. There are seasons that are great with our kids, but some seasons where they rebel and they are struggling with their identity are not so great. And this is what we hear. I hear parents start to say this, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with my kids. You fight. That's what you do. You get in the fight and you fight for your kids. You fight spiritually. We're going to fight spiritually and practically. You fight spiritually. You pray for them. You don't just pray, God, help my kids. You call them by name. God, help my son, Nolan. God, raise him up to be a man of God. Protect his identity, Lord. Lord, Pray for my daughter, Clara. She's got a hard head. She's going to be a leader probably. You know what I mean? I'm calling them by name. And when things get really tough, you and your wife start fasting for your kids. They don't need to know you're fasting. Just tell them you're on your new diet after Thanksgiving. (laughs) Trust me, they'll believe it and they'll know it will only last for a day. You know what I'm saying? But God only needs 24 hours of my fast, baby. (laughs) That's what you can do spiritually. Believe God for a miracle, and then you surrender them to God. God, they're yours. I've done all I can do spiritually. I prayed, I fasted, I'm surrendering them to you. But practically, some of you are like, amen, amen. No, parents, it's time to get practical. Okay, I'm sorry. But that doesn't mean that you can say, I've done everything I could do, and now I'm just giving them to God. All I can do is pray. I'm giving them to God, which really means you gave up. You gave up because God is calling you to parent them. Don't stop parenting your kids. That's what you can do practically in the valley. You can parent your children. If you don't like who they date, say they're not allowed. Listen, my grandma never encouraged anybody to do anything. Parents are like, oh, I encourage them strongly. No, you are their parent. You're just going to tell them, you're not doing that. I'm your parent. Listen, if y'all... Grandma's no best, man. It was not many words. It was just a lot of whipping like this. You know what I'm saying? They'd, they'd walk into a room. They didn't even know who they're hitting. They're like, someone got in trouble, and like kids are fleeing out of the room like, like mice, you know, and grandma's swinging. It was great, man. That's what happens when you're a product of the Great Depression, you know? It's like you just came in and start hitting stuff. But you've got to parent your kids. You've got to parent your kids, or someone else will. Ground them when necessary, celebrate them, love them, but keep them in God's house. That's what you can do practically. I understand that they're going to be in sports, but keep them in God's house. And you, when you've got to step out of church for a season because they're playing sports, this is what you tell them. You line them up and you go, listen, for the next six to eight weeks, We might not be at church as much. You might not be at youth group. You might be getting there late, but I need you to know this right now. And you look them in the eye, real serious. When this is over, you're getting your butt back in church. (laughs) Because I'm keeping them in the house of God. That's what I can do practically. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for them. But I'm going to do everything I can do practically to fight for my kids. Amen. What about our marriage? The enemy wants nothing more than to end your marriage. That's the plan he's got for you. And he'll use anything to do it. He's after your marriage. He doesn't want you to succeed. Society doesn't want your marriage to succeed. When things get tough, we have to remember that there's a spiritual fight and a practical fight and that we have to be engaged in. What can we do spiritually? You can pray together. I know that might be awkward for you. You're like, well, I've never really like, what do I do? Just sit together. Drink some coffee. Make it a rhythm to pray with your spouse. Fast together. Get into a small group together. That's what you can do to fight spiritually. But then there are practical things you can do in your marriage. Prioritize date night. Understand that kids are not supposed to be the priority in your marriage. Your spouse is supposed to be the priority in your marriage. I, I, I lean to say don't let your kids know that, but it's actually healthy for your kids to know. Hey, if all hits the fan, I'm choosing mom over you, all right? You're out. Okay, I love you. I love you, but this is my girl right here. They need to see that. They need to see, they need to see a man of God who loves his wife more than anything else. And men, spend more time with your wife than you do fishing, than you do playing golf. Show more interest in your spouse than you do your phone, okay? Prioritize each other. Do what you have to do practically to keep it together. 
What about our finances? Everyone's like, ooh, Black Friday hit you a certain way. And you're like, let's talk about finances, Pastor. Bless me. Bless me. Because Cyber Monday is tomorrow. <laughs> we have to fight for our finances. You, you can't not fight. It, to give up is not an option. God wants you to have victory in your finances. You can have victory in your finances. I believe that. But you have to fight spiritually, and you have to fight practically. Spiritually, the Bible is really clear. The Lord says, test me in this. You give, see that I won't open the floodgates of heaven and bless you. That's what the Bible says spiritually. So what do we call that? We call that the fast. This is what I believe with my whole heart. I believe God can do more with your 90% than you can do with 100%. So I'm going to give God 10%. God, this is my offering to you. I believe you're going to bless me. You're going to take care of me. But then practically, what can you do? Practically, you can get on a budget. You can join Financial Peace Small Group. You can stop going to Starbucks every single day. I get in line with people who are like, well, I can't tithe. And we're in line at Chipotle, and they're ordering double meat because they don't scoop enough. <laughs> They're like, give me, give me some guac in there as well. I'm like, y'all, that's like a $15 burrito now. And then they get to the end of it, and they're like, get me a large drink, chips, and some queso sauce. And I'm like, dude, you, you are out of control right now. Like, I kind of like it. There's a thrill to this, but this is crazy. I can see how this gets out of hand. So they don't do practically what they should be doing, and it keeps them from doing spiritually what they need to be doing. You've got to fight on both fronts practically and spiritually. People are leaving. I'm talking about finances. They're like, get me out of there. <clears throat> it's okay. It's okay. Get around anyone over 80 and they'll just, they'll be a lot more honest than I am with you about this. I'm being serious. You sit down with my grandpa, 87 years old. I flew out to Texas to visit him and he had all the family around him. He said, Brennan, my nephew so-and-so doesn't tithe yet, but everybody around this table tithes, and God's blessed them, and I want him to know that, and I'm paying for everybody's meal, and I'm going to let him know, and I'm like, you tell him, Grandpa, you bold, but it's the truth. God wants to bless you, but you got to do your part. You've got to do your part. The last thing that we can, we can do, the last area we need to fight is for our mental health. Yes, pray. That's what you can do spiritually. And I know you're like, Brennan, I've been praying, and 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 these feelings don't go away. You don't stop because God is your victory, but you can also do practical things. There are people who've walked through this for years, and all you need to do is say, man, I'm going to go to get some counseling. We have a Discovery Counseling Center. We offer free pastoral care to our people. You can get the help you need from someone who has walked through that before, who can come alongside you and say, listen, we're going to pray together, but we're also going to do some practical things so that you can have freedom in your mental health. You can have that victory today. Do you believe that? God wants to give you victory there, but you're going to fight spiritually. We're going to fight practically because there is a fight. When you're fighting your battles, whatever battles those are that you're fighting, we're going to do two things. We're going to fight the, from those two places. We're going to give God our best in the valley while holding up the banner of Jesus on the mountaintop. And I can't tell you that you won't have to face an Amalek in your life, something so large that you have to fight. But you've got to be on that mountaintop. You've got to be praying. The third key to victory here, the third key for you Having victory is identify your Amalek. You've got to identify your Amalek. After the victory, this is Exodus verse 14, the Lord instructed Moses, write this down on a scroll as a permanent reminder. Read it aloud. I will erase the memory of Amalek from under heaven. The Lord said this, I'm going to destroy Amalek. Moses, write it down. He didn't say I'm going to get rid of part of Amalek. He said I'm going to get rid of all of Amalek. You see, the reason why some of us are losing the battle is we still want to play around with Amalek. We want to play around with the thing God said, you got to get rid of all of that if you want the victory. We want to get rid of half of Amalek, most of Amalek. But God said, I want to blot it out. I didn't want to just get rid of a little bit. God wants all of it. You want a part-time victory because you like some of what Amalek is giving you. God knew if he didn't get rid of Amalek, it was going to come back. If you have cancer, 
you don't leave a little bit. You don't go to the doctor and go, hey, you just leave a little bit. I'll be fine. No, that cancer is going to come back and wreck you. You go get rid of all of it. I don't want any of it in my body anymore. I'm Take it away from me. Don't even get me near it. I want all of that gone. Some of us are playing around with Amalek with the things that we know God wants out of our lives. You're flirting with a coworker. You're cheating at work. You're hiding a secret addiction. You're holding on to something that God wants gone. You're spending time with people who are toxic. And you wonder why you can't find the victory. Why you keep coming up against the same fight. And it's the same rhythm. And I've walked with people for years. And it's the same thing. It's the same exact thing because they won't get rid of all of it. It might not kill you physically. But it's going to take out everything you love. That's been your excuse. Well, it's not killing me. It's not hurting anyone else. Oh, it's not going to kill you, but it's going to kill your marriage. It's not going to kill you, but it's going to kill your soul. It's going to rob you of your joy, of your peace. Amalek comes back. They come back. God said I was going to blot them out. And then we see King Saul, 1 Samuel 15. This is what the Lord of the Heaven's Army declared. I have decided... To settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. This, is, this was his order to us and to Saul. Now go and completely destroy the entire Amalek nation. Men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. Get rid of it all. And I know some of you are like, that's wild. Okay, that's how they fought back then. The total destruction of the Amalekites was an echo of the flood and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember that? It's also an anticipation of the final judgment at the end of the age. It's a reminder that those who persist in sin and stand in opposition to God will face the judgment of the Lord. That's why God was saying, you got to blot that out. All of it's got to go. So he goes to King Saul. He said, go and get rid of all of Amalek. And Saul goes in, he defeats them, but he keeps some for himself. He spares the king. He keeps some things, the finest things, and he justifies it. He goes, well, I'm going to tithe on that. I'm going to sacrifice that at the temple. And Samuel comes back to him and says, you disobeyed what God told you to do. You are no longer anointed as king. And you know who killed King Saul when he died? An Amalekite. He was killed by the very thing he spared. God wants you to get rid of all of it. God wants you to blot it out. When God says get rid of all of it, he isn't trying to be mean. He's trying to protect you. He wants you to get rid of all of the evil. Some of us are hanging out with some of the evil, and we wonder why it keeps coming back. You're giving visitation rights to the thing God's trying to destroy. It's the evil that's trying to keep you from reaching God's purpose for your life. But you got to get in the fight. And so my question today is, what's your Amalek? What's that thing that God wants out of your life? That thing that the enemy's using to keep you from ultimate victory? The thing you need to get rid of? God wants it all. So what do we do? What do we do when we're in the battle? How do we win the fight? Like, we're fighting, right? Like, I'm, okay, God, like, I'm believing you're my banner. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in the fight. I'm going to fight spiritually and practically. But God, what do I do? When I, when I decide to face my Amalek, when I decide to face that thing, and what you do is you look up. You look up. You see, when you're in the valley and you're fighting, when they were in Rephidim and they were fighting and they were seeing people die and they were killing people, when you look around you, you don't see God. You see the fight. And some of you, you're in the fight, and that's what you see. You see everything around you, and that can be depressing. But what you do is if you looked up, if they looked up when they were on that battlefield, they would have seen Moses up there with the staff of God, the same staff of God that was their banner. They had seen God do miracles through that staff, and they knew the God of heaven's armies is fighting against me. Jehovah Nisi, my banner is fighting for me. So what I do when I'm in the battle and I want to give up, I look up. I go, God, you've got the victory for me. You declared that in your word. The battle belongs to you. I'm going to look up. I might not see you in this, but I see you in that. God sees you where you are. He sees beyond your battle. So I look up and the Lord reminds me. The Lord reminds me that this battle is his battle, that I might not see a victory. 
I might not experience the victory that I thought or the outcome that I wanted, but God sees it and I'm going to fight and I'm going to believe for the victory that's coming. That's how you experience total victory God's way. And it's this, the reason we can do that is because we recognize and we know that he is our banner. I love Psalm 121. It says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I love that. There's no enemy too strong for God. We can fight from a place of victory when we look up. And I know in a room like this, there are some heavy battles that are happening. I know because I have my own battles. But today I declare over you that the Lord is your banner right now in this season. Over your battle, over your family, over your finances, over your mental health, over your children, he is your banner. Will you look to him? Will you look to him? Will you allow him to be the banner that you fly in your life? He is your victory. He's going to sustain you through this, and he will not let you be overcome by that which is currently overcoming you. He is Jehovah Nissi. He is your banner. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.